Well, welcome. I'm Steve Carver, and uh, my organization is called the Academy of Entrepreneurs and Associates. <clears throat> and basically what that is is just a bunch of folks like you and I that are uh, working hard to keep our businesses going and uh, have a good place to exchange ideas and network and such as that. I've been doing this for about 16 years now. <clears throat> this is my presentation number 960, so I'm uh, well on the way to 1,000, and I appreciate you all being a part of it. I'm darn proud to be associated with entrepreneurs. Uh, my dad was one starting in 1959 when we got started in business, and I've considered myself an entrepreneur for 63 years and just love it and have worked with literally thousands of other folks getting their business started and enjoying a better life because they did. Uh, we're facilitated tonight by the Small Business Center over at Roanoke Chawan Community College. Uh, Derek Armstead is the director there and a really good director he is. I encourage you to make an appointment with him if you're in that area. Uh, uh, he got a lot of good information to help you business-wise. He's a Marine, so we salute him for his uh, military service. Uh, attended, uh, has a law degree, uh, went to university, Central University in North Carolina, has a long history of helping entrepreneurs. So I'm very pleased and honored to, to be able to work with Derek and encourage y'all to do it. If you're not in the Northeast North Carolina area where he would help you, but would like to get in touch with the Small Business Center in your area, just let me know in the email and I'll, I'll tell you who and where to go see and even make an introduction for you. And I look forward to doing that. The small business centers are very, very helpful. I got started in 1959 when I was 12 years old and been doing business ever since. So I'm not somebody that read a book and I'm going to try to tell you all about it. I do it every day. I stand in business. I work out of my home office right here in Dunn, North Carolina, uh, which is just about 40 miles from, from Raleigh and about 30 miles from Smithfield and uh 30 miles north of Fedville, so uh, right here on Interstate 95. So anytime you're coming through Dunn and want to make a visit here at my home office, I'd be glad to glad to have you. We'll have a glass of tea and see what we can do. Except for the four years I was in the U.S. Coast Guard, stationed off the Outer Banks of North Carolina and Virginia, I've been doing business, love it, and I continue to do it till my last day. Uh, we had a, uh, for 52 years, we had a bricks and mortar uh, tractor and implements and equipment dealership in Dunn. This is what it looked like at the time. I have since sold this property, but my history goes back doing a lot of things, starting a lot of businesses, enjoyed working with over 2,000 employees, 12 different businesses, written five books, uh, and now enjoy uh, my internet business selling equipment and also doing this work with, uh, with uh, an honor to do work with, with you guys. Uh, the small business centers in North Carolina are located at each one of the community colleges. And so if you've got a community college in your region, that means you've got a small business center that would love to help you as well. Uh, <clears throat> my main income comes from a, a internet website, carverequipment.com. Been in business on the internet for 30 some years where we sell lots of implements that go behind tractors. And I'm fortunate enough to have a customer base all over the United States. Through that 30 years, I've done a lot of groundbreaking, the first one to do this and that. Uh, uh, learned a lot, made a lot of mistakes, and I'm glad to share, have, be in a position to share things with you guys so that maybe it'll save you some money and help you get started. Uh, good news, this week we're going to start face-to-face -face, uh, seminars again. I'll be traveling, traveling down to Bayboro, North Carolina, to give a face-to-face -face, uh, seminar presentation this Thursday night, be the first one since uh, March two years ago, <clears throat> and looking forward to getting that started again. However, most of my work is still uh, doing webinars. I'm not a lawyer and not a CPA. I've just been a fellow that's been in business a long time and glad to share uh, information with you. And the first piece of information I always share is never make a really big decision uh, that's going to affect your financial security or your business interests without getting two or three opinions. And a good place to get an opinion is at your small business centers. If you are registered here, hopefully you were email study guides. That is uh, the talking points of this uh, program tonight. And 
really helpful if you have them as we go through this. If you do not have a study guide, if it wasn't emailed to you, if you're in chat, if you'll go there and type in Steve, please send me a study guide and make sure you give me your email address so I can do that. And then Jan, I don't not see in your email address showing you may have typed it in, but I can't see it. Uh, I'll be glad to send you the study guide so that you'll have them. And then if you care to, you can go back through the uh, uh, video that I'll send to you and, uh, and, have, and actually do the class with the study guide. It'd be quite helpful. Actually, I will mention to you that these study guides with your new employees that you're bringing on board uh, will give them a lot of insight on uh, setting their schedules and seeing how much income that they, they can make uh, if they work at it. So this week, we're, of course, on board tonight, <clears throat> and tomorrow night, be back right here, same time, same place, talking about how to price your products and services. And this is a really important seminar for all entrepreneurs and different types of businesses. So I'm glad to uh, to share that and invite you to come and be on board with us tomorrow night as well. And then, as I mentioned, on Thursday night, I'll be traveling down to Bayboro for a person-to-person -person seminar on 24 things that you must do to get a business started. So this week we're starting up two real busy uh, series. Um, on Wednesday nights, I'll be on, uh, online here every night on Wednesday nights and on Thursday nights for the next seven weeks. So you're welcome to join us uh, for any and all of them. Uh, the Wednesday night series are how to start a business. And, of course, uh, this one tonight is a part of that. And if you attend five out of the seven, you'll be eligible for a, a certificate of completion, a real nice uh, frameable certificate. Uh, but you will need to remind me uh, about your attendance uh, because I, I really like to send those certificates out because the more we have, the more members of our Academy of Entrepreneurs and Associates. So these are Wednesday nights, and this is a variety of different types of businesses that uh, people might have an interest in starting. The Thursday night sessions, the first two will be person to person. So if you're not in the Bayboro area, you probably won't be able to go to those. But the next five will be online. <clears throat> and if you attend the five online ones, you can uh, uh, be awarded a certificate of completion and graduation for the 14-hour training course that covers about 300 different areas of what you want to do to have a better and more sustainable business. So I look forward to seeing you a whole lot during the next two months. If you want to come on board on uh, Wednesday and Thursday nights, so I'll be right here to work with you. And I uh, just look forward uh, to doing that uh, and helping you gain information. And we all learn from each other as we go. Now, getting into the process about having a salon or a barbershop or having a chair that you're renting in a barbershop or a salon if you're a stylist or a barber getting started, there's pretty much eight strategies that will apply to any business that you ever plan to be into. And young folks just getting started, uh, this is basically for them. Uh, it's important, and I always try to stress the importance of how, uh, how to, that their credit worthiness, their credit score, and their credit lines are very, very important as you start a business. Your reputation in the community uh, has a lot to do with whether people come to you as a barber or a stylist, and your credit reputation precedes you whether you know it or not because people will talk about it and share that information with other folks. So you want to maintain a good credit score and pay your bills because places that you're not paying your bills or you're slow, that word gets out, then people aren't going to come and do business with you. Uh, the better customer you are for other businesses, the more that other businesses will send customers to you. And all of that is related to your credit worthiness and your credit lines. If you need to improve your credit score, if and we all probably do somewhat, I've got a really good study guide that if you ask for it in the chat button, I'll be glad to send it to you. That will give you lots and lots of ideas and ways that you might start improving your credit score. Uh, anytime that I can help you, I'm always glad to do it. Now, you've got a place in your uh, on your uh, uh, board for, for the free conference call, a place that's called Reactions. Uh, and if you'll check that out, there's a place that you can click on a uh, hand there. And if you click on that hand, I'll see it on my participants board here. 
and know that you want to ask a question or say something or make a comment. And you're very welcome to do that, okay? Number two, you're going to need a base of customers, a regular base of customers, so that you'll be able to fill your schedule up every week and have a good, sustainable business. And if you own a salon or you want to grow your business, when you fill your schedule up and you keep, have other customers keep coming in, it's time that you can bring on other people <clears throat> uh, to, to start filling up their calendar and you rent a chair and help uh, make more money that way as well. But I like to call our raving customers, <coughs> excuse me, our raving fan customers. That's customers that uh, go out in the community and brag on you, send other people your way. And having raving fans uh, is, is the key to having repeat business for a long, long time. And our other webinars and seminars, we spend a lot of time on how to create raving fan customers because they don't happen by themselves. Next, all of us need a customer database. That is a long list of email addresses. And in your business, a salon and barbershop, you also want to have tech uh, uh, cell phone numbers so that you can send out regular uh, uh, communications, promotions about what you're doing, to remind people that you're here, to remind people to send other people your way. And you do that by having a database that you use and send out continuous promotions. It's the continuous promotions that fuels continuous sales. People will forget about you. People won't think about recommending you. But if you've got a good group of customers and you're sending them emails from time to time, that remind them about what you're doing or congratulating them for a birthday or, or, or something that's going on special at your shop, those can, continuous promotions make all the difference in the world about keeping your business going on. Now, a vital sign for every barbershop and every salon is the, 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 the uh, different things that hold it together, uh, that make things good. The number one is the owner's ability to forecast. Uh, that is uh, to know basically what opportunities that you can pursue in your business to create more profits and more sales. And the, the number one thing is you want to be in a position for more and more upselling opportunities. Upselling. That is, what can you uh, have there for your customer that comes in and, and, and procures your service? What extra things can you have for them to go out the door with to make them happier they're doing business with you and make you so much more happier because you're going to be stacking your profits when you are doing a good job with upselling of different products. So many different people uh, that have uh, seen these seminars have told me through the years that the upselling opportunities at their salon and barbershop have just made a tremendous difference in their profitability. You want to have different profit centers, and a profit center is something that you do with your business that makes money. I like to talk about marketable profit centers that are uh, the individual things that you can market separately. Uh, there's three different kinds of profit centers. There's one kind is things that bring in new business and new customers. Uh, in a salon or a barbershop, a, a, a profit center that brings in new customers might be doing something special for first-time customers. Uh, doing something special for customers that are new to the community, uh, doing something special for folks that bring in a friend. Uh, do all you can, if, even if it costs you a little bit of money, to bring in new customers. So why is that important and first on my list? Because you'll lose a third of your customers every year. Most businesses lose one-third of their customers every year. People die. They move away things change. So if you're not adding new customers all the time, you're backing up. And if you don't grow your business, it means that you need to add more customers than you're losing. So we need to add profit centers that bring in new business. And then we want profit centers that create continuous business. Yes, yeah, one thing to get them in the first time, but now we need to keep them coming back. And things like those product sales, uh, different items that we're offering, different programs you might have with customer loyalty programs, like a, uh, every uh, fourth uh, time you come, you get a discount or you get a free product or something special. 
uh, continuous business, uh, meaning that you're after uh, uh, work at the schools or, or you have certain dates that people uh, plan that you're going to help them from time to time, things that you can put on the calendar that help you see way down the road. Because every slot you can fill in on your calendar represents cash flow for down the road. And the last type of profit center are those that bring in big ticket sales. What can you do to really have some large deposits some days? And if you don't plan that and you don't work towards having big ticket sales, it's not going to happen. So what would you do at a salon or barbershop to create some big ticket sales? It might be that you uh, work uh, for weddings. It might be that you have a continuing uh, work with the mortuaries. It, it may be that you uh, have some special products there, uh, uh, in, uh, certain types of uh, plants that you put in hairs or weave-ins or, or jewelry or leather or clothes, items that you can have that really – uh, someone came in to uh, procure their regular service from you, but when, while they're there, they buy lots of other stuff. <clears throat> that helps you make a whole lot more profit. That's what the big ticket sales are about. I want you to have at least five of these profit centers in your business. If you're just doing one thing, one thing will go south one day. Boy, COVID sure proved that, didn't it? A lot of folks just had to flat go out of business altogether because they were just doing one thing. And with all the different types of businesses that COVID shut down, it may have shut them down as well. Please forgive my horses and my voice. These uh, allergies this spring have been working on me. Five profit centers, lots and lots of different things that you might have in your business. And we'll, I'm going to show you a lot of them here in just a little bit <clears throat> because the more profit centers you have in your business, the more profit centers you have in your business, the more money you're going to have in your pocket. That's just the way it is. So look at the different ways because this is a, this is a type of industry that you are looking at here tonight that has more easy to – incorporate profit centers in the business than any other that I know of, period. First of all, you have a captive audience there that while they're sitting there, you have in, you have the ability to, to do your sales pitches or talk about the different things that you're doing <clears throat> and encourage them that as soon as they get up, to let's go check out something else that you might do. And that's when you're saying, and by the way, we've got this and that. But look at all the different things that you might either be need to be you could be doing as a service or products that you might be offering a barbershop owner or a salon owner that is not maximizing their their product sales is missing the boat big time uh, I've helped several uh, shop owners over a period now of pl uh, 15 plus years see how this helps them and now they are actually paying their rent, paying their utility bills, and actually adding even more profit in the teal from their product sales because they're focusing on it and making sure that not only the customers that are coming in for services have the opportunity to buy these products, but also the public at large. So they're advertising these things, be it jewelry or, or, or candles or lotions or cosmetics or leather products uh, right out. Uh, just like your regular retail store. Why not? You've got it there for sale, and when you bring a customer in, they may be one that uh, starts doing regular business with you as well. One of the staples for your business, though, is attitude. Uh, salon and barbershop owners know this. New folks coming in need to be reminded that attitude is everything, just plain. It's kind of like if you've got a flat tire uh, in the morning, you're not going to be able to go anywhere until you change it, right? It's got to be fixed. Well, attitude in a salon or a barbershop is exactly the same way. People need to pull together. There needs to be a team spirit uh, to make uh, the barbershop and the salon, salon really work. Now, you know a whole language related to your business there. I know that. Different chemicals and colors and different styles of cuts and maybe some of your different clippers and tools and scissors and combs and brushes. You know that language. But there's another language that if you're going to be in business, you need to know another language as well. And I call it the language of small business. And there's a few buzz terms 
that really help bring things uh, in, into focus. And I want to spend just a minute on those. Let's talk about number one, A, B, C, D, just as simple and elementary as it can be. And I relate that as to always be connecting the dots. Always be connecting the dots. And what I'm asking you to do there is be in the habit of, as a business person, when you're making decisions, to make decisions that fit what you're doing in your business. Sometimes something will look really good to us at the time or it feels good at the time, but in the long term, it's not the right thing for us to buy or do. So always be connecting the dots as you're making business decisions for the future of your business. I like to talk about the low hanging and ripe fruit when I'm referring to customers. And people that are uh, getting new into the business and <clears throat> salon and shop owners that are bringing in new employees and you're trying to help them find uh, ways to fill their calendar up, Mention the low-hanging and ripe fruit because what that is is if we go out to harvest fruit, we get the low-hanging and the ripe. That is, we pick the fruits that's the closest to us and the easiest to reach that we can uh, put in our basket and harvest without spending a lot of money and time. The same principles apply when we go after new customers. Look at the customers that you already know that are close to you, easy to reach, family members, cousins, associates and friends, as you're starting a survey to build your customer base, look for those people that are closest to you and, and focus on them. Now, the fact is you're going to have to get knocked down a bunch of times before you get up. Most of the time, we'll have to ask folks at least nine times or, or send them a promotion nine times before they'll give us any business. Why is that? Folks want to know that you're stable, that you're going to be here to stay before they start uh, uh, honoring you with their business. So tell your entrepreneurs, tell your folks that are brand new, you just can't give up. You have to keep asking and keep smiling and be willing to, to uh, show the steel that you've got in you and let people know that you're hungry and you really would appreciate a chance to serve them. You do that locally with your right, with your low-hanging fruit, you'll start getting some business. Now, as soon as you've got that under control and you've got a good customer base, then go big. You can go outside of that low-hanging fruit range to, uh, to start working with your specialty groups. But to begin with, you, you try to focus on getting the local folks to come on, let's get you started so you can start creating some cash flow. Then a buzz term is cost of doing business, C-O-D-B. And in business, when we're first getting started, we may not remember that not only do we have to, to earn enough uh, income to, to, to meet our goals, our income goals, but we also have to earn an additional amount of income to pay overhead to pay the cost of doing business. And so we're, when we're looking at how much money we need to make, we've always got to remember that we've got to make what we want to earn plus what it's costing us to run the business. And we'll get into that pretty strong in just a few minutes. Our customers are our most important. Without customers, we are nothing. And I like to use the term MTFI, which means make them feel important. We're always trying to make our customers feel important. And when we forget that, when we slip and we start thinking that we're more important than our customers, I want to tell you, you're headed the wrong way. We have to make our customers feel important for them to stay with us for a long time, and we just have to keep working on it and on it and on it. NDCP, no demand, change the plan. Like rock, paper, scissors, no demand, change the plan. What this is is when you're up and running with a business plan for your new business or new profit centers that you're starting, and the business plan is, is showing you that you're not making uh, profit here, it's not working for you, what I don't want you to do is to throw this plan away. You don't trash can it just because when the first time you add your numbers up, it don't look like it's profitable. What you have to learn to do is to change your plan, is to be flexible. If you've got something good, it's got uh, possibilities. Sometimes you have to massage it and take it apart and put it back together two or three times. So always be willing you know, that if you're not getting the demand that you need for this profit center, to be willing to change it. And then there's three really important words. And uh, so many shop owners through the years have said this is the most important slide in the whole presentation, and that is the three words, by the way. 
because if you've got a little sticky note at each one of your stations and up by your uh, desk where people come and go and pay up, and you've got a little something that reminds you to say, by the way, what that is doing is saying, and by the way, my friend, we've also got this product. We've got this uh, uh, tool. We've got this cosmetic. We've got this other thing that we've got here for sale that you probably would enjoy or maybe someone in your family would enjoy. Getting in the habit of saying, and by the way, and then telling them about your upsell opportunities is the way to start increasing your profits. Not sometime, but tomorrow. That's how important it is. I've had maybe as many as 10 shop owners, because I give this presentation uh, all over the state to lots and lots of uh, salon owners every year and barbershop owners. They come to me, and they've done it now for many, many years, and saying, we put up little sticky notes all around our store to remind every every person in every chair that before that client leaves, we use the words, and by the way, you might want to do this or that. And they have, from the first day they started doing that, and coaching the employees, of course, telling them about the upsell opportunities, from the very first day, they saw their profits start going up and saw their sales start going up big time. So no extra charge for this. This is just free. It comes with the program. I'm glad to share it with you. Now, we've got folks that are on salons, and then we've got folks that are renting chairs or maybe people in school that are thinking about what they're doing. So everyone is important, but everyone may have a different situation. So whether you're uh, brand new in, in the business and just renting a chair from a shop owner, uh, or maybe you're ready uh, to, to uh, uh, rent your own shop, maybe you want to go out and start your own salon or barbershop and, and rent a building. Uh, maybe you have a, a, a interest in partnering with other art, artists and coming together with a group of people to rent a shop. Uh, your goal may be just to, to rent a shop, uh, to own a shop and rent it to the stylist or the artist. And you're not in the, in the game yourself. You just want to be kind of a, a real estate type uh, a business person. And that's just fine because you don't have to be a, a, a stylist or a cosmetologist to, to own and run a salon. You don't have to be a barber to own and run a barber shop or many, many salons or many, many barber shops. So uh, maybe you're interested in buying an existing shop. Maybe you have a shop now and you're interested in how to position it to sell it. Or maybe you own a shop and you just want to be in a position to sell it in the future. And all of these are important different issues that are related to being in the barber shop or the salon business. And so many people are involved in these industries, but it may be in so many different ways. So if you have a particular interest in any of these specifics, and we don't give you the information that you would like tonight, please send me an email. Let me know what's on your mind. Everything's confidential. I won't share anything uh, except with uh, Derek over at the uh, Small Business Center, and he won't share it with anyone else. Uh, anything that you're thinking about that we don't address tonight, then if you want to ask it confidentially and in private, then send me that email or give me a call and we can discuss it and maybe I can give you some pointers how to help you. We are here to help you and uh, there's no charge for it. So uh, let's take it and go with it. Uh, every, every shop has got a different flavor and a different uh, tone, and that's one reason I love this business so much. Everybody does it differently. But the three magic words, the long-term sustainability, and I'll be saying this over and over because I really want it to sink in to each and every one of you, the three magic words is, by the way. By the way. I can't teach this enough, and you can't say it enough when you're in business, in the salon and barbershop business. By the way is going to be the money making is three words that have ever been said. So a little bit of housekeeping stuff. Uh, what makes a shop run better and such as that? First of all, the relationship between the uh, people that are renting chairs and the shop owner are very, very important. So I would suggest that if you don't have one, that you have a rental agreement. In other words, you have it in writing uh, what the deal is, what the rent is, what's expected, uh, what will be tolerated, what will not, and by golly, put it in writing so that everyone knows where they stand, and then you go by the rules, go by your agreement, and, and, and you work with it. 
it's very, very important that everyone knows where they stand when they're doing business and folks live by that. It's really important that a shop has the consent waiver forms for your customers because you're dealing with chemicals now, uh, with products that maybe are dangerous for some folks and may not be for others. So you don't know that customer who's coming in to see you what their medical situation is. Maybe they, you've been doing business with this this lady for years and years and years, but maybe she's going through some stuff that the uh, products and the chemicals you use, you were using on her hair and skin for years, maybe this time it's going to cause her some problems because she's using some different medicines or whatever. So uh, at the cosmetology school, they teach this, and I want to in, in, uh, enhance it, that you want to update these waivers every time that customer gets a certain type of treatment or, or chemical. You just have these available. It may be a little awkward to begin with to get them to sign it, but once you get in the game uh, and you get used to it and they've done it one or two times and they just know it's a part of doing business, you have your clipboard there, you have your forms there, and you get those signed and uh, and do what you need to do. Do not Do not try to fast track or dodge the importance of getting waivers in your type of business because it could be very, very important to you. What is the key at a shop that sets the tone for customers feeling good and wanting to come back? What are, what are the things that you can do uh, to make your business more inviting for your customers? Well, I like to say that uh, setting customer expectations is important. Think about yourself. When you go to a business of any type that you've been to before or maybe you've heard about it, you're going to walk in there thinking about what are my expectations? What's going to happen to me when I'm in here? Am I going to be happy? Am I going to get this? Am I going to get that? Will I be satisfied? Do I think I'm getting a good investment? You as the business owner, be it the salon owner or someone that's renting a chair, needs to think about seeing your business through your customer eyes and what their expectations are. Setting off the, uh, the the event in a good way, you don't get but one chance to make a first impression every time you make it. And we make first impressions the first time we meet someone, and then we make our first impressions every time they come in to see us in the future with those first few seconds. Every customer deserves a sincere welcome. Every person deserves to be seen. Hey there, we're so glad to see you. Uh, it's good to see you. I hope things are going well. A sincere welcome helps uh, the beginnings of those expectations get off on a good foot. At the barbershop or the salon, maybe two or three people are busy and you're concentrating on this and that. People come in and the folks at the back of the line don't see them or busy and they just ignore them. Well, Here's where the salon owner has the responsibility to say to the first person closest to the door, it's your responsibility, no matter what you're doing, every customer that walks in here, it's your responsibility to welcome them. In other words, sign responsibility so that you don't have to worry about any customer coming in without receiving a warm and sincere greeting. Having value-added enhancements. What in the world is that? A value-added enhancement are things that you do for your customers that doesn't cost them any extra money, but they really appreciate it. It sets you aside and apart and makes you look better and be better than your competition. Value-added enhancements. Do you have that going on at your shop? Do you have that going on for your customers? What are you doing for them? Number one rule, keep that waiting time as short as possible. Yes, sometimes you might have to have more staff on board to help. You might have to have some assistance for your uh, for your stylist to help move things along. Uh, uh, the wait time is the most awful time that you will have for your customers unless you've got some places for them to shop and buy things while they're waiting. So you see how that extra uh, uh, product uh, might come in handy? Uh, folks that are waiting have a chance to do some shopping. But you want to keep that wait time as important, as uh, as short as you possibly can. <clears throat> and you want to set those ex expectations so that the customers will keep coming back. 
One of the most important things that I'd like to see shop owners do or stylists do or barbers, the very minute one of their customers come in, they greet them, they say hello, and the next thing's out of their mouth is they give them an estimate time to have, that they're going to have to wait. Uh, maybe things were running slow. Maybe they got a late start. Maybe there was an emergency. Uh, so when you tell that customer, okay, I'm so glad to see you. Uh, we should have you in the chair within 20 minutes or 45 minutes or something like that, depending on what it is. And you might be able to say to the customer, uh, put your name in the queue here. If you got something you need to do and can be back at this particular time, we'll be ready to take you in. But if they come in, they deserve a spot in the queue and you need to give them an estimate time for service. <clears throat> uh, it's hard to tell sometimes, I know that, but that is important to your customer, and they will appreciate the fact that you think that their time is valuable. That's the key. Is It's not all about you and your time. It is you are very uh, aware of the fact that their time is extraordinarily important to your business. So... The whole team at the barbershop, the whole team is at the salon needs to have a spirit of oneness, of teamwork. We're all in this together. We'd like to smile. We'd like to greet all of our customers, <clears throat> whether I'm going to serve you or my friend down at another chair or two is going to serve you. We still want you to know that we are so glad that you're doing business here at, here at the salon or the shop. Creating that spirit is one of the biggest jobs that a salon owner can do. And sometimes you actually have to have some meetings with your staff and have some people modify their attitudes <clears throat> if they're coming across as not friendly or not pulling their weight with the rest of the team. Then you need to say to them that, look, uh, smiles don't cost a penny. They're free and they're priceless, but they have everything to do with making our customers welcome. And that is important to each and every member because who knows the next time someone comes in, they'll bring a guest with them or refer someone. So when you're being nice to that person, maybe they're not sitting in your chair, you don't know what's going to happen next time or who they might recommend to come and see you. <clears throat> uh, here's a, a Red at his barbershop. Sometimes he'll just sit outside on the sidewalk and greet customers as they walk by. Pretty cool thing to do. They don't have a lot of time to do that. They're very busy at the Beardy Goose. Those value-added things are things like when you're washing and rinsing hair, those extra few minutes you're doing with a massage scalp, uh, even offering in some uh, special barbershops now. A lot of barbershops don't even offer to, to wash and rinse the hair. They just uh, act like it's something that they're too good to do. But the customers that want it is really important to them, and it needs to be offered. And when you're giving those shampoos, that little bit of extra massage, a little extra touch, a little extra few minutes doing that, make the difference in someone coming back on a regular basis, make a huge difference on how much tip they might give you. It's a, it's a big deal, the value added. So if you've got new people coming into your business, you want to make sure they understand the importance of value added enhancements. Head and shoulder massages, uh, clipping hair at the nose and ears and eyebrows, especially with men. Uh, uh, you know, we got hair growing in places we can't see and in the shade, and it takes uh, sometimes that person, the stylist, to, to get us trimmed up and looking good. And uh, that's the right thing to do whenever you can do that. <clears throat> when you start giving these extras a part of your regular package, it delights customers, and they then become raving fan customers. And it's perfectly good for you to remind them that you're doing this and that. It's all right for you to say, hey, I'm glad to do this uh, work with your ears and your eyebrows or about a few extra seconds here with the head and shoulders massage. That delights customers. It gives them the value-added enhancements that they need to really brag on you and to really talk, tell other customers to come out and work with you. Take another swallow here. Anybody got any questions so far? I'll be glad to talk with you. Anybody got any comments? Let me know anytime you want to. In North Carolina, if you're new to this game, in North Carolina we have two agencies that help look after the industry. The Board of Cosmetology is in Raleigh, and they do a bang-up job. They're very important with education, with licensing, with inspection of shops. They're the folks that come around and do the inspections at every salon 
Make sure you're playing by the rules and you're playing safe. They have a lot of power. If you're thinking about getting in the salon business, you need to visit their website. You need to know what the board is all about from A to Z and spend some time there reading and looking and, and seeing what they have to do. You, of course, will be meeting some inspectors, and they'll fill you up even more. You have to do some exam work. Uh, there are a lot of frequently asked questions there, but the board is important, and they're an everyday part of your life in, in the business, so make sure you understand the rules of the road. Uh, they'll do uh, uh, offer you in the handouts. They'll give you some inspection uh, checklist. Uh, they help you with individual license, with health and safety issues. The board does a lot of good work. The same for your board of bar barbers. The uh, barbers board of examiners do basically the same thing. They check out barber shops. They make sure you're qualified and get the work done. People come in and go in. They handle complaints and issues folks uh, have about barber shops and performance sometimes. So in the barber industry, you want to be aware of that. More and more folks are not only salon uh, are getting their degrees and certificates as barbers, but also as cosmetologists. So they're dealing with both boards, and that's a good thing to do that. Let's talk about some things that you might want to consider as you're moving into this business. First of all, your, your vision and balance is really important. You as an individual, uh, thinking about entering into this work, where you're going to be standing up all day long, you're going to be seeing lots of different types of people with a world of different types of possibilities. You'll be dealing with a world of drama every day. Uh, if you own a shop or a salon, you're going to have a lot of things to deal with with employees and people coming and going with lifestyles and all the different distractions that people bring to, the, to their business every day. So learning to balance your dreams and your vision learning to, uh, to appreciate the intelligence and energy that you have, evaluate and take an inventory of your skills and your business management skills. Uh, how's your work time situation? I mean, you've got a life, you've got a family, you've got things to do. How much of your time can you give to your business? And this is tough to manage. I know it's tough for me. And uh, We've just started out the spring season, and if you're into – and the equipment business that goes behind tractors, uh, selling implements that go behind tractors. I mean, our business uh, went from almost dead still three weeks ago to wide open, and I'm putting them 16, uh, 12, 16 hours every day and sometimes more. And so time uh, is fleeting, and you wonder just how are you going to keep doing this and manage it. Uh, and your business is the same way because if, you, if your staff – lays out on you and you have to look after uh, other people's clients and do this and that, it can become very challenging. So I want to encourage you just to grab hold of all the issues that we're talking about. Relax. Let's figure out a way to, to bring balance to all of this so that you can be a good business owner, <clears throat> a good entrepreneur, enjoy your life, and make some good money. And one of the best ways to do that is to actually have a business plan. A business plan will help you avoid so many pitfalls through the years. And it's kind of a, a blueprint and a roadmap of where your business has been and where it's going. A business plan helps you uh, get a good handle on how things may go before you invest your time and talents and treasure. So I'd like to talk about business planning a little bit. And actually, I mentioned this to do you. This is one of the most important parts for people that's just coming out of cosmetology school and just coming into business is not is learning to, to balance their budgets and balance their times to make things happen. Uh, if you have a good idea about what your investments are going to bring, then you have a, great, uh, a greater opportunity not to lose those investments when you chart a course and you, and you know where you want your business to go and you're kind of following a timeline and a map. When I'm doing business planning uh, seminars, I like to refer to uh, putting a business plan together in little models or like Lego blocks. I'll have blocks for expenses, and then I'll have blocks for income. These are estimated, of course, when you're first getting started. <clears throat> and then as we start our put, putting our blocks together, we'll end up with a pretty good business plan. So let's talk about that just a little bit. 
look this over. I use this at the cosmetology schools a lot, talking with young folks who have never put a business plan together. But whether they knew it or not, they've been operating with their personal income, operating on a budget. And a, a weekly budget planner that an individual uses is a whole lot like a business plan that a business uses. We, we uh, estimate the, mer the money that we're going to earn, and then we have a pretty good idea on how much money we're spending, and we, we can see if we don't have enough coming in to, to maintain our budget or maybe have some left over to put together for some special events. So this is a simple individual uh, personal budget that someone that's in barber school or cosmetology school <clears throat> might look like in their personal. Uh, maybe they're getting a $30 allowance. Uh, maybe they got about three jobs, uh, part-time jobs, where they're earning about $75 a week. Uh, maybe they got another job where they're getting about $50 a week and a, another job where they're working six hours and making about $60 a week. So this individual with their allowance and their part-time jobs is bringing in $217. Over here, they're estimating their expenses, everything from lunch money to cars and uh, a birthday gift, and cell phones and clothes, and maybe some putting aside some money for some tire repair and a little bit for church even. They're planning on spending around $144 a week. So this individual's budget would look like money coming in, 217, money going out, 144. So they're planning on having about $73 a week extra money. All right? Uh, so they're working hard, uh, trying to plan their expenses, trying to plan so they don't get out of line. Well, that individual that's doing that uh, would bring in around $870 a month and end up with $291 a month. So they've got them a budget going on. And annually, that same individual, when you take the same numbers and extrapolate them into an annual budget, would end up with an extra $1,100 a year. So this is a good working budget for someone to think that I, that I can keep my head above the water and not be spending more money than I'm bringing in. The key is you have to write down the numbers and think about them to actually see if you end up in blacking here black ink, which means you're bringing in more than you're sending out, or red ink. So let's talk about uh, how the business plan might work. Lots of things uh, uh, come into play, uh, like if you don't lease a, a building, a uh, local license, a uh, uh, startup cost can be really significant. Anyone that started a business uh, and rented a building sometimes has to refit and do a lot of repairs. Uh, you don't have to buy some furniture and fixtures, right? Uh, have to do some staff recruiting and maybe buy some uniforms, uh, uh, buy stock to sell. I've mentioned all these products that we're going to sell. You have to come up with the money to buy it to begin with. We need a sign. We need to let people know where we are. So we have to plan on spending some money for signage. And, and to get started, we're going to have to do some marketing to, to let folks know where we are. <clears throat> and until we get some money coming in, we're going to need some working capital uh, to get us started to uh, to pay the bills until we start making enough profit and cash flow to do it for us. So each one of us need to kind of get us a list of what our startup costs are going to be. Now we can get on we can go online uh, easily and get estimates on on uh, how much furniture cost estimates are. And as you can see in the slide here, they run anywhere from uh, eight hundred to sixteen hundred dollars, depending on how fancy you want to get the different type of things that you're going to want to buy. Or maybe you're going to look to some used products, and there's a lot of places that sell used equipment. You have to be careful with that, but you also might find some really good bargains. But you can do some good shopping to estimate your costs uh, in doing that. Uh, I always want to say, and I've said to the folks that are getting started, when you're buying your chairs, your barber chairs, and your styling chairs, always buy something that's nice and comfortable. Because the biggest asset you've got is your customer's rear end. And when they go in that chair, you want to make sure they feel good and want to come back and sit in that chair. It is your home base. So spend a few extra dollars to get an extra comfortable chair. 
if there's bells and whistles there that'll make your customers feel better, you try to find the funds to buy. In other words, do not cheap out. Do not try to save pennies to save, uh, to make dollars when it comes to the actual places that you're going to have your customers park in uh, while you, that you're performing your services. Uh, all different types of equipment are available to you. I've been told by lots of folks in the salon industry and the barbershop industry that the individual can probably put their private tools together for $500 or less, but it's certainly not that case for the salon owner but the individuals that are renting chairs have to do their part as well. So getting started with your business models, we're going to have to know some things. And you're going to have to uh, give some thought to what are your earning goals? We A business plan is designed to try to meet your goals, not just something out here in the air. If your goal is to end up with $10,000 a month, then we're going to need to do a business plan that creates that kind of energy, that kind of marketing, that type of uh, customer traffic that can bring in $10,000 a month. That would be a whole different business plan than if your goal is to bring in $500 a month. You see the difference? For the same token, your earning goals are going to have a lot to do with how much time you're going to need to spend in the shop. Maybe you've got lots of other things you have to do besides just uh, serve your customers, a lot of personal distractions or responsibilities. So what time are you going to be able to spend in the business? Then we'll know how, to be, how our scheduling will need to work. We'll also need to know how much time you're going to be there, therefore how much the prices are going to need to be for your different types of services. And the thing that takes the pressure off the individual time in the shop or the amount of prices that you serve for what you do, is here it comes again. When you bring in those and by the way items, these different profit centers, you have the opportunity right here to make money without you having to spend time doing it. Your different product sales, your different profit centers will generate revenues for you to help you reach your goal without you having to actually be there uh, doing things. Now, once we do this, we're going to need to list down all the basic costs of doing business. Remember I mentioned earlier CODB? Well, there it is, cost of doing business, the different items in the business that don't have to be spent. Now, here's a, here's a good example of product sales and different things that you can be offering. And I like for people to have a good menu up so customers can see what it costs to get this done or that done, or maybe you even have a handout or a take-home uh, menu for folks. When your shop is not only delivering personal service to your customers, but also offering them a wide variety of packages that they can can, uh, can buy from you, then you've got the ability to really start stacking profits and have some big-ticket sales. Uh, this is a really nice uh, uh, menu board that's in a shop here in Dunn. So I'm glad to show it to you as an example of maybe it's something you might want to consider as well. Okay, let's move into now. Do I really want to get into this business? Is there is there enough room here that I can make a living? Uh, how much money can a, a stylist, a brand new stylist or a barber make uh, doing the trade? Well, I put this uh, program together at the request of maybe as many as 10 different cosmetology and barber school uh, directors at different uh, community colleges across the state just so we could show their students what their income potentials might be if they uh, pay attention to what they're doing and actually get serious about marketing, about filling their schedules up, about being a good team player at the salon. Pretty impressive numbers here and uh, lots of shop owners have told me these numbers are very realistic. Of course, it may change from, from different community to community, but pretty much on target. Let's say that you're going to be a stylist uh, and you're going to work. Uh, you're going to rent a chair and you're going to work. Or let's say that you own the shop uh, and you operate a chair in your own shop. Either way. But you've got a schedule where you come to work in the mornings. You start at 9 o'clock and you start serving customers. And you've got several appointments lined up here basically on 30, 45-minute basis. And your morning traffic brings you in $290. 
That's your morning traffic from uh, 8 o'clock to 12.45. Take a break. Come back at 1.15, and then you start seeing more folks. You have some folks that you're doing color with and some trims and some wash, some other items, some colors. In other words, you, but you're going to work all the way to 8.30 that night. You're putting in a full full day's work, bringing in $480 in the afternoon session. Well, when you add that together, that was 2.90 in the morning, 4.80 in the afternoon. So your day's work generated $770 in revenue. Pretty good day's work, right? $770. Is this unusual? Is this unseen? It is not. This is right in the groove with an average that I've been told with people across the state. Seven seventy. Now, Barber, he has to see more people to make the same amount of money. However, he has a chance to do a, a, see a lot of people doing that. And he comes in at 7.30, and he works through 12.30. He sees a lot of people. I mean, people in and out of that chair in a hurry. He brings in $320 in the morning work. And in the afternoon work, just as busy, a full schedule. Uh, closes up at 7.30 uh, uh, with $275 for the afternoon work. So he didn't bring in quite as much money as the uh, stylist did, but he bought in a healthy 600 bucks, 595 for his day's work. That is daily revenues, okay? It is doable, but that is a full schedule. Now, is a full schedule pack stem to stern every day? Is that realistic? Yeah. If you've been in business long enough and you've got a good clientele, or you've been in business a short period of time and you've got a good clientele. You see, here's the thing. You don't have to be in business a long, long time to have a full schedule. What you have to do is to do the, the right things as a business person will do to promote, recruit, uh, talk value added, give a few extras, and you can fill up your schedules in a hurry if you're, if you're doing the work the right way. So let's average this out so everyone can appreciate what we're trying to do. The stylist was at 770. The barber comes in at 595. Uh, well, add those together and average them out. So that's an average between the two of them of bringing in $680 for the day's work. So here we go. I got to be realistic here because usually when I'm giving this webinar or seminar to brand new students, I know when they go to work, they're not going to have a full schedule. So let's don't, let's don't even pretend they are. I'm going to go ahead and take out 55%. I'm going to take out 55% of these earnings for this purpose here, uh, so that I'm saying that if you just do 45% of your potential, these are the kind of monies that you'll be looking at and earning. So at 45% proficiency, you're going to bring $306 in a day, and work in five days, if you only work five days, that's $1,500 a week, $1,530 a week income. Most people in the industry, most people in the world say, wow, this looks like a great opportunity for work, especially when they're reminded that this is only working at 45% efficiency. So there's cost of doing business to work with, though, right? So let's say we're bringing in that $1,530 and we're renting a chair. Now, I've looked all over North Carolina and talked to salon operators even tonight to see what average chair rental is. And the average that I'm coming up with is $160 per week as an average. And I just talked talk with Ashley, who owns a, 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 a salon in Roxburgh, and she said that is pretty much in line with what she's charging per week. So if a person is paying $160 per week chair rental, and they're bringing in $1,530 a week in revenue, then that leaves them, after they pay their chair rental, $1,370 per week as a salon operator, as a uh, cosmetologist, or as a young barber, working at 45%. <clears throat> so let's take that $1,370. I don't give you, I don't give you four weeks vacation. I'm figuring only 48 weeks here and not 52. So uh, having four weeks off, you'll bring in $65,700 for your weeks for your year's work, and the salon operator with seven chairs uh, with uh, 
and has six of them that she's renting for $160, the salon operator will bring in another $49,900 in chair rental. How about that? Still, this up here is at 45%. And we know the salon operators are going to operate at a higher percentage than that. So this is the person that's renting. This is the person that owns the salon. Let's do some comparisons. The great factor that comes into play for a salon operator is they get the biggest advantage of earning the profits from product sales. Even if, see I'm, I'm working at 30% here, even if you doubled your money and you had 50% profit and you gave 20% to the individual stylist and you kept 30%, 58 weeks working a year at $150 uh, basically uh, uh, products that you're selling by each operator, you'll bring in $17,640 in profit, not in revenue, but in profit uh, from product sales. That is a good, good chunk of change. So the salon operator with her personal income and her chair rentals and her profits from uh, product sales has got a gross income here at $133,000. That looks like a ton of money, doesn't it? Well, let's just don't get too excited too quickly because there's expenses to pay. There's always expenses to pay. There's going to be shop rentals. If, if you don't own the property, you pay in rent. you got uh, utilities. you got insurance, uh, marketing, advertising costs. Uh, maybe you made some impro improvements or, or, or bought some new chairs. You're, you're having to pay that debt back at a, a monthly payment. And you've got just generally a cost of doing business, just Mickey Mouse items that have to be paid. So your cost that you had to spend to make that $133,000, $63,900. So what does the tax statement look like at the end of the year? What's left? That's what our business plan would tell us. $69,300. Wow, 693 that's for the shop owner. Hmm. Well, let's do some comparing now. The person that was renting the chair was bringing in 65700 and the shop owner 69300 That's not a whole lot of difference, is it? Especially when you have to consider the shop owner had to, had to do all the work as far as keeping the staff there, being responsible, paying the rent, uh, uh, have the headaches of handling all that money. Uh, just do all the things that a shop owner has to do to only end up with an extra four thousand dollars. Well, don't get too unexcited there, because remember here that this person renting the chair was operating at forty-five percent, and the salon owner, the money we put in here was at forty-five percent. So these numbers in a real life are going to be really much higher and much attractive. And there's a lot of things that I don't know that we have to uh, to, to consider that individuals have to play into this. Uh, maybe some personal expenses that, that are, are extraordinary. <clears throat> Health insurance, uh, uh, how you're arranging your taxes, uh, bookkeeping expenses and risk management, things that you're doing. Maybe you're putting aside some money or, or making some uh, arrangements for selling the business. And maybe possibly you're actually on building your uh, business plan so you can sell it. And I'll put this in right now. I want to encourage every shop owner and salon owner to plan to sell their business one day and to keep a business plan ongoing with a set of books and financial records so when someone looks at your business, they'll want to buy. The great thing about this type of business is that it's one of the easiest to sell in the whole marketplace in America. Because if you've got a good, a good salon or barbershop, uh, with good people and a good customer base and you're uh, keeping it on, then you can sell that business to a, a number of different people that are either number one, want to buy it for themselves, or add it to a number of group of chain that maybe they're, they're starting. But getting back here, what's the difference? About $4,000. So why in the world would someone want to own the salon if all they're doing is making $4,000 more 
than the uh, chair operator and putting up with a whole lot more stress and things to worry about. We'll get to that. The significant unknowns that play into everyone's thinking is how many days a week and how many hours are you willing to work to put into it? Remember how you got to move from that 45% up to 100% to really get into the good bucks. And all that is about attitude and all that about is about your ability to change the priorities and, and, uh, and strategies to put you there serving customers longer. Uh, how much uh, time are you going to be able to get from each, each client? Are you serving that group of clients, that low-hanging fruit? Are you bringing in kind of clients that you can maximize your payments or maximize the amount of money that you're making uh, uh, with what you're doing? Uh, is your location of your shop a major factor? Maybe in the location that you're at or you're thinking about, it just won't work, and you have to accept that or figure out what you have to do to make it work. So when it all comes down to it, have you got as many chairs in this place as you can uh, put in there comfortably and it look nice? Have you got as number of chairs in this place as you can to keep them busy? What is your leadership and mismanagement skills telling you? And this is the, the point that brings a lot of people back to our, our webinars and seminars on a regular basis. I have a, a, a large group of, of salon owners that will show up uh, many, many times at night uh, for our webinars, depending on the, the topics, just so they can broaden their range of understanding of how to run a business. Because here's the good news. You can own a salon. You can operate in a chair. But you can also be other types of businesses as well. You can be an insurance agent and, and a salon operator at the same time. And there you have a captive group of people coming in every day that might buy, be buying insurance from you or other things that you might consider. So the, the greatest thing about uh, this type of business is you're creating relationships with your customers. And those relationships can be expanded to cover lots and lots of different kinds of businesses. So what are we going to do? to get this business up and running as soon as possible. Uh, what business do we need to look after taking care of it right now? First of all, I need to ask you, are you set up organization-wise to get a business started? Uh, do you have a computer? Uh, do you know how to work uh, uh, Microsoft Word with Office software? Do you have a good internet connection? Uh, do you know how to use email and, and, uh, and do printers? Because when you're getting your business started, you're going to need to have some regular files. Your planning calendar, uh, you, uh, how you plan your appointments. Because now with like Google My Business, you can have people schedule their appointments right online and do it for you. Uh, several barbershops here in Dunn and several salons, uh, people are making their own appointments online, doing it electronically, and Google's doing it for them. So there's a world of technology out here now to help the uh, shop owner and help the customers uh, move into the new world. Are you starting or, and you'll need uh, to start files with your organization of your database of email addresses and cell phone numbers? You'll want to start keeeping some business journals to remind you of what's working in different seasons and also doing your budget. So keeping up with your budget and your expenses. This is also where you look at your different profit centers and track what's making money and what's not. Because sometimes you'll have to maybe move out, stop doing this, and start doing other things. Again, uh, uh, jewelry and clothes and leather and cosmetics all can be really hot items, but they also can be hot size nails, not going to be hot later. So you have to keep up with what's trending and keep the hottest items uh, in your shop that you can. Uh, getting started, you're going to want to establish a banking relationship, a checking balance. Uh, which, When you do that as a business, you're going to need an EIN number and get set up with license and permits and insurance. If you had never done this before, this is where our webinars uh, that are starting uh, uh, next week or this week actually uh, can help you uh, learn the things that you will want to do to actually get a new business up and running. You want to create the timeline for your business 
the, t the timeline for your business to help show you uh, what hours is going to work best for you to run your business. Uh, and think about that. So uh, maybe you're just thinking that it's going to be a, a, a 10 o'clock in the morning to 3 o'clock afternoon. And maybe you can serve a certain number of customers that way. But if you want your business to grow or you want to have other people in the shop with chairs, maybe you need to open at 6, 6 in the morning and stay open at 9 at night. That's going to depend a lot on the team that you build and just how you want to attack and, and, uh, and address and target these particular markets of customers that are going to become your niche market of customers. Uh, a lot of uh, men, for example, uh, will go to the salons, uh, but they want to go on their way into work. They want to be there early uh, or, or maybe uh, come by after they work. So if the salon operator is welcoming a, a gentleman to their business, uh, then you might have to change some hours to suit them. And this is another way of bringing folks in where you have these uh, uh, value-added things like a cup of coffee, maybe a, a chocolate chip cookie, uh, some soft drinks, maybe some ice. I uh, even hear about some salon operators that offer a glass of wine sometimes to certain clients uh, after a certain time of day. So you'll do the things that keep your best customers coming back, coming back to you. And to stay in touch with them, you need to send out fresh bait. If you don't catch fish, you need fresh bait. If you don't catch customers, you need to be sending out promotions on a regular, regular basis. That's all about uh, regular uh, business, operating a business. So let's talk about energizing and executing. You as the owner need to be out front. Be proud of the fact that you're an entrepreneur. Be proud of the fact that you own your shop, that you're moving forward. Everywhere you are, I want you to be demonstrating and introducing yourself and making people feel excited about coming and seeing you and your team and, and uh, just wanting to do business with you. There is a time that as an entrepreneur, you have to take on a predator attitude. You have to be aggressive. Uh, uh, things don't happen by themselves. We need some assertiveness in this world. I'm not saying to take this to the point that it's a negative, but you do take it to the point to let people know that you really want and need their business. Yeah, people want to come and help folks that want to be helped, and people want to, to, to feel like that they are becoming a part of something that's going to be there a long time and that they are appreciated. In other words, are you a salesperson? Do you have those skills to help you make sales? And that's important when you've got a shop full of products that need to sell to make you extra profits. Again, this is another place that we can offer good tips and good tools in our webinars and study guides about salesmanship and merchandising uh, and, and uh, advertising uh, different products uh, to help you be more effective and not waste any money in things, but to do it just right. Follow-up is always important. Being willing to follow up with your customers time and time again to make sure they're happy, to make sure to, and you're offering feedback and getting testimonials from folks that, that are enjoying what you do for them. And when you get those things, you want to have a place to share it, like uh, on your own uh, website where you can share testimonials. What does that do for you? So, uh, your best chance to get a new customer is someone new that's moving into the community because they're not loyal to someone else. So if your website and your Facebook presentations are showing all the good things that you're doing and good things that people say about you, that is an automatic invitation for someone to say, well, everybody else feels good about doing business with them. Well, I can too. Keep up with your, your history and your business journal and your database because that's going to come to really help you one day if you ever decide to sell your business. Now, the study guides that I'm going to send to you, if you don't already have them, and again, if you don't have a study guide yet, make sure that in your uh, uh, chat room here that you type in, you know, Steve, please email me the study guides, and then give me your email address. Uh, whoever just came on board with us from Orlando, I want to welcome you on board. I want to invite you to go to your uh, chat board and give me your name and your email address so I can send you anything that you need as well, too. So being an entrepreneur, first of all, congratulations. Just so proud of you for being here, for letting me be a little part of your journey tonight, and for you spending some time uh, with me as well. If you're imagining and if you're believing 
then we don't start achieving. And then in the next uh, 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 seven weeks, uh, on Wednesday and Thursday nights, I do hope that I'll be seeing you right here, and we'll talk about all different areas and aspects of business. Now, we're not limited to, if, if I know you're coming on board one night and you want to talk about something altogether different, if you'll send me an email before we get started, number one, I will incorporate it into the presentation, or then you and I just set up a separate time to talk about your individual issues. And I'll be glad to do that. I enjoy doing that. I'm a busy fellow. i got a lot to do. I work a lot of hours. But helping you guys is the most uh, gratifying thing that I do, and I'm just really happy to do it. I want to tell you how much I appreciate you being with us tonight, and hope I'll see you a whole lot during the next two months. Let your light shine. Uh, I want God to bless you and your family and your business as well. Uh, I'm proud to say that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, and I'm planning on going to heaven. And I know that if I'm doing things the way that he would want me to do, I'll probably have a better business and certainly make a whole lot more friends. Whoever you believe in, that's your choice. And I just salute you. But let folks know that you're out here to help other folks. And let me tell you, your business will start growing just as soon as you start doing that. So thank you for being with us tonight. We're going to take a few minutes after we sign off. And uh, 